Father, we honestly, truly, from the depths of our heart, give you thanks. We give you thanks for your grace that brought us into fellowship with you. Your grace that keeps us in fellowship with you. Your mercy that redirects us when we go astray. Your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you for your word that comes to instruct, to rebuke, to correct, to train us for righteousness that we may be equipped for every good work. This morning again as we come before you in your word, Lord be present to teach be present to bring light and understanding to our simple hearts. Lord, may your word be spirit and life this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. I want to do a few quick things for the short time that I have. One is to truly appreciate this church. I've been part of Four Square Gospel Church for a little while. And with every sense of humility, I thank God that you set the pace. Praise the Lord. You set the pace in many ways. I'm not just talking about the, the, the high tech. I only heard of, what is that quid driver? What do you call it in this church this one? I'm not just talking about that. But when I look at the lives being transformed, the little drama you watch, and the performance of the kids, the intentionality to bring the next generation into the glory of God, the simplicity of faith and worship. You've been excellent. I may God continue to make you excellent in Jesus' name. But don't, not just excellent in the way you do things or the way you do church. But now more than ever, we need the sons of God to be manifest in our generation by the quality and integrity of life they live. And I'm praying that as we excel in many other things, we'll excel in being light and salt where the Lord has placed us in Jesus' name. The hope of our nation and generation does not lie with politicians. It lies with the sons of God rising up in the name of God and representing God wherever he has placed you. That the Lord will help us to continue to do in Jesus' name. I also want to really appreciate you as a church for the support you give Capro Mission that I serve with. Not only have you released your pastor over the years to be a critical part of our international council, giving direction giving counsel, strategic direction. From this church are people who have intensively supported this work, supported missionaries. I don't want to mention names, but I know that when we think of the, the reason why Capro is and does what he does, this church has a big role. Capro is funded 80% globally from Nigeria. Uh, I'm talking of... I'm talking of a mission that is now in 37 countries of the world on five continents with over 720 missionaries from 24 different nations. The last nation we entered, Saudi Arabia and Australia, working with the aborigines. And God has used you to sustain this work. Some of you pay children fees for missionaries, some of you provide a base for us to function when we have our meetings, and some of you give. May God bless and reward your honor. Amen. You know, the true measure of a local church is her rich in vision. And even though you are local, God is helping you to be global by the things you do. The Lord will bless you. Amen. And thank you for those who called to condole us. We lost a missionary in the last two weeks. And God has used some of you to comfort her. We haven't buried her, but thank you for the comfort. 
And I want to ask you to keep praying for us. In August, we have one of our very strategic meetings. We call it a Capro Congress. That is where our leaders and partners throughout the world come together once in four years to review the vision, re-strategize, and elect leaders for the next term. Uh, somebody needs to succeed me by August. Amen. So please pray for us. It's an expensive meeting to call. But God will provide for what we must have it, so it must hold. And he's holding in Lagos, he's holding at Orchid Hotel. Uh, Pastor Dega is the chief host. <laughs> and uh, so please pray for us and feel free to ask, how can you be part of that meeting? I know that this church and the leadership have been invited. Thank you. But I wasn't here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about intimacy with God. And... I know that I'm just one of several speakers that have been speaking on that topic, so I don't claim to summarize it. But I, I produced the outline, and this outline is meant to be a study outline for you to study in your home with your spouse and make sure he's not sleeping and the boy is not on phone. Amen. So because it's a Bible study, I want you to really go to, to me, this is the most important study you can ever have. Praise the Lord. But I'm not going to go through the study in this service. That would be a silly and boring thing to do. I'm just going to do what I learned from this church, how to be a Sunday school superintendent. I'm going to highlight and summarize and lead us to a point of prayer. Amen? Let me start by asking a question. What do you consider, which do you consider to be the most important verse in the Bible, or the most popular? What did we say? If only the slide can go away from me, I'm not the important thing. Can we have the slide move on, please? I don't like my face too much. Go on, keep going. <laughs> Praise the Lord. John 3.16, who wrote it? Eh? Who wrote it? Now, if it's that important, why do you think John was the only person that wrote it? Why didn't Matthew write it? Mark didn't write it. Luke didn't write it. All his Luke So why do you think it was John and not the other disciples who wrote it? Why do you think so? Hmm? You know, John has a very interesting way. I'm not talking about John O'Baron now. I'm talking about the John in the Bible. John has a very interesting way to introduce himself. The disciple that Jesus loved. And he never failed to attach that to his title. The disciple that Jesus loved. They were running to the grave. But the disciple that Jesus loved ran faster. As Jesus was talking to them. The one that used to lean on Jesus' church. The disciple that Jesus loved. And I used to ask myself, why does he have to bamboozle us with that title? But truly, John, it would appear, was the closest to Jesus' heart. Jesus had the thousands, the 120, the 12, the three, but the one. And that was why John could be the only one qualified to write John 3, 16. Because when you lean on the chest of God, the only heartbeat you hear is love, 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 love. So whether it's First John, it's about beloved, let us love one another. Every book of John hinges around love. Praise the Lord. The reason because he was that close to God's heart. And it's important to know that when you are close to God's heart, Let's read John, uh, Jeremiah 9, 23, briefly of all the texts. Then I look a few things in John 21. Then we'll summarize. Can we look at Jeremiah 29, 23, 24? This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Or the strong man boast in his strength. Or the rich man boast in his riches. No. Those are the three things that make people boast. Strength, wisdom, riches. Hallelujah. Nobody boasts outside those three. Let him who boasts, boast about this. 
that he understands and knows me. Hallelujah. If there's one thing God has allowed us to boast about, it is in our knowledge and intimacy with him. Not just knowing him, but understanding him. I recall this issue of intimacy. When we were in the university, I was very close to a young man, a medical student. The one day he died. And because he was such an outstanding student, the whole university had a service of song for him. And the vice chancellor asked around, who knows this young man enough to talk about him? And everybody said, Sam. And when they called me, I realized I didn't know much about him. I was so embarrassed because on the outside, it appeared I was the closest to him, apart from his girlfriend who could not summon the courage to talk about him. But in reality, I didn't know that. May that not be our experience of God. On the outside, people think you are close to God. But in reality, you don't know about him. That day, I made up my mind that I will never be close to a man and not know about that person. So I will ask all the questions. and I will try as possible to even go to the village. Because you don't know a person, do you know the roots? The other day, my wife and I attended a 10th wedding anniversary of a couple. And they did this couple game. They remove one pair of shoes. They give the wife. One, they give the man. And then they back each other and they ask questions. Okay, who cracks the most joke? If it's you, lift up the... And I watched that game. And I found that at some point, the couple will not show. But sometimes they contradicted themselves. (laughs) So, closeness and intimacy are not the same. The difference is knowledge and understanding. And the Lord says to us, if there's one thing you must pursue and boast about, is that you understand and know God. There is a difference between knowing someone and understanding someone. You know, when I'm in public, as I'm preaching now, I'm not looking at my wife because if I'm looking at her, she may ask me to slow down. The way she looks at me, I know she's not approving something. Or sometimes she's saying, don't go there. So when I want to be free, I don't look at her eyes when I'm preaching. (laughs) So, you know, when you understand somebody, body languages, gestures will give you knowledge. I don't know how it happened, but sometimes I'm praying. I don't know how God makes me to see his face. But as I look into his face, I don't need to talk about the issue and pray. I just see disapproval. He doesn't say a word. So one thing we need to boast about is that we understand we know God. Hallelujah. John 21 is a very interesting passage. I'll just summarize it and then go into a few things and we'll pray. John 21 tells us the story of Jesus' resurrection. When Jesus rose from the grave, As close to the Jesus as the disciples were, do you know they didn't believe his story about dying and raising up? They didn't. Why would they not? He talked about it every time. But you know, in their heart, and typical of men, you hear what you want to hear, isn't it? They were expecting a political messiah. The disciples were not expecting a spiritual messiah. They were expecting a president that will come and stop the Islamization agenda, stop the modernization of posts, and put Christians in positions. Make sure that they dethrone Dangote and put Odega. Right? That's the kind of president they were looking for. And then he died. End of game. Just as they were about to nominate another presidential messiah, they say he rose again. What a confusion. In fact, the ones who were headed to Emmaus, the road that leads to nowhere, were so confused. Then when those women came from the grave and said he's risen, they were further confused. 
They wanted to go and confirm. The Bible says in John 21, I saw then they had not believed. Why would they not? I see so much of that in our time. Many of us were looking for a social political Messiah. And Jesus, for him to be Jesus to us, must fulfill that role. When he doesn't, we are asking, are you the one to come? Or do we expect another? So when he doesn't meet our political goals, we talk about manipulation. If there is manipulation, there must be god -dipulation. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. So, but when Jesus appeared, John 21, they were busy fishing fish. Peter went back to his business. I'm not talking about your pastor. And when he went, he dragged everybody along. That is a danger of leadership. When you go off tangent, you can't tell how many people you are taking along. Peter went with them. And the rest went. And Jesus came. And the Bible puts it very well. He was by the sea roasting fish. I don't know where he got it. They, after they caught nothing. Now, this is not the time that Peter said we caught all night. This is a different time now. He said, little children. Did you hear how he calls them? A man who will abandon God's purpose for his own is a child. Little children, do you have fish? They say, how can we get fish when we caught nothing? He said, go back. And they caught and when they came by, he had prepared food for them. The Bible said they didn't know he was a Messiah. They didn't know. And then, after a while, John said, it is the Lord. And then Peter wanted to commit suicide. He, was, he removed his dress and wanted to jump into the sea. But Jesus called him back and asked him, do you love me more than this? Feed my lamb. Do you love me more than this? Follow my life. Follow me. As Peter was following, he turned and saw this disciple that Jesus loved sleeping on Jesus' chest. He said, Lord, you're asking me to follow you. What will this one do? And Jesus said, if it's my will that he stays here till I come, what is that to you? Now, the story ends by saying, when the disciple wanted to find an information from Jesus, they all met and told John, go and ask him. Now, the question is, what stopped them from the others from going? Why must it be John that will be the daily gate to find out the secret from Jesus? It only shows us that intimacy with God gives some certain privileges above others. The privilege of knowing his heart and knowing his mind. Praise the Lord. Friends, God has always desired friendship with man. God has always desired an intimate relationship. He created us for it. When he created us, he put his spirit in us. It's like you bought a nice iPhone 7 Plus for your wife and you didn't put a SIM card inside. How will you communicate? So this body is just like the handset. God put his spirit, the same card. So by his spirit, we are able to connect with him. He will, we were the only being he put his spirit in. So he can relate intimately with us. When sin broke that sin, he paid the supreme price in Christ to bring us back to himself. Hallelujah. And whereas every other world religion defines God in terms of father I mean, slave master. That's how they define our relationship with God. Every other religion apart from the Christian faith does not place man in an intimate relationship with God. The Bible tells us by his spirit in us, we are able to call him Abba, Father. What does that mean? Daddy. You know, it's one thing to call, this is my father. It's another to say, this is my daddy. When children call you father, they say, Gap. When they're able to call you daddy, something has given way. And there's a closeness. So God desires intimacy. So as we talk of intimacy with God, let's remember that he desires it. He initiates it. He wants it. We just respond. You know, it's one thing when a girl is chasing a guy. 
It's another when a guy is chasing a girl. I hope you know the difference. Most girls will rather respond to guys chasing them. But please, don't be a gay chaser. Be a God chaser in Jesus' name. When you chase girls, you may fall and break your heart. When you chase God, you may find a good girl inside that will comfort your heart. The Lord will help you in Jesus' name. So God initiates it. We love him because he first loved us. But in this short few minutes I have, what is intimacy? I explain it, give examples of it, show a few elements, and then how do we establish it, and then how do we distinguish it? We close. What is intimacy? Intimacy is simply, intimacy is about closeness, friendship. It means to be close, to understand, to have a closeness to somebody. Affection, your emotions are involved. You are affectionate. There is not just a biology, but there is a chemistry. I hope you know the difference. As you are sitting in church this morning, even if you are sitting to one sister, all you have is a biological connection. When the chemistry comes in, you know there's a problem. (laughs) So it's not just about being close to God, being in church. It's about a desire and a longing. Hallelujah. A cozy, private Personal relationship. How do you know couples that don't have intimacy? They show off in public. I'm very suspicious of couples who only hold hands and hug in public. Something makes me suspect it's a call for show. (laughs) There's no happening in the secret. I'm suspicious of brethren who in church, Lord, I love you with tears. It may happen, but are you doing that when it's you and God? Or you are just doing it for sure? You know, intimacy is largely a private thing. Hallelujah. It may manifest in public, but it's a cozy, quiet, private thing. What are examples of intimacy that we can see in the Bible? There are many, but I'll mention two quickly, three. One is how in Genesis 3, God created man and wanted that relationship, put him in a garden. So the Bible says in the evening, in the quiet, in the cool of the day, he will come around. He will communicate. How is it going, Adam? I hope the elephant didn't give you trouble today. Did the lion behave? I hope the mango gave you the fruit you wanted. Did rain come on time until one day God showed up and didn't find them? You know, trouble has come. God loves to come around and discuss with you the issues for which he has called you to do. If he has called you to be an accountant in an office, he wants to come around and, how is it going? I hope the MD is not filing false vouchers. If he puts you in charge of a business, he comes to discuss it. He wants to know. How is it going? How is it going with your children? How is it going with your wife? How is it going? God loves to come on a one-on-one. And he did that with Adam. Amen? The Bible talks about Enoch. Enoch walked with God. What was the evidence? What was the evidence? He was no more. When you walk with God, you will extinguish How do you know a man is intimate with God? You become less and less of you. And people see more and more of God. When Enoch walked with God, he became less and less of Enoch. He distinguished. He walked with God. We see Moses in Exodus 33 and Numbers 12. God said, if there be a prophet in the land, how do I talk to them? Visions and uh, dreams. But for Moses, how do I talk to him? Face to face as a man talks with his friend. That's an example. 
God wants to talk to you face to face. And the excitement of the Christian life for me is not what I do for God. It's the fact that I have access to this God. When Jesus died, the veil that covered the temple was broken, torn. And the Bible says he made a new and a living way where only one high priest went once a year to see him. Even them trembling, they had to tie a rope around his waist. People have to hold it outside. Once in a while, they shake the rope, he moves. If he's alive, the moment he doesn't move three times, they drag a dead body out. But now, by the new and living way through the blood of Jesus, you can even come in with your feet dirty, and he cleanses you. May the Lord give us grace to go in more. We can come in boldly. If they threw the voice of the central bank to you to help yourself and you came out poor, who will you blame? So if God opened all of himself to you and you have a poverty of spirit, you are the one to blame. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. We see another example. Jesus and the fa- God and the Father. In John 5, 20, Jesus said the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he does. And then the son is able to do it in like manner. Serving God, in a sense, is easy. You know how easy it is? What is God doing? How is he doing it? And when there's an intimacy, he will show you. Hallelujah. Over your life, over your business, over your service, over your ministry, Sunday school. What is God doing about Sunday school in VGC? He will show you. How does he want me to do it? He will show you. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Finally, Jesus and the disciples, we saw him in John 15 saying, I do not call you slaves. I call you as what? Friends. For a slave does not know what his master does. But whatever I receive of the Father, I give you. Where there's intimacy, there's openness. Many of us want to serve God as his slaves. I have bad news for you. God is not looking for slaves. He's looking for sons and daughters. In Hebrews 3, the Bible says, Moses was faithful in God's house as a servant. Jesus was faithful as a son. Your father owns Orchid Hotel. Let me use a business that is safe. And you are working there. You are different from the other employees. Imagine for five months they don't pay salaries. You will be the last to leave. You are working for a family legacy. The others are working for a salary. When you work in God's house, you are working for a kingdom family legacy. You are not working for a salary. That's why whether they pay you or no pay is not the issue. The motivation is that I'm building my father's kingdom. Hallelujah. The prodigal son didn't get that. He said, look, give me what is mine. Let me go away. There are so many prodigals in the house. Father, bless me. Prosper me. Promote me. Once they do, they walk away. They don't consult him how to handle the prosperity, how to handle the marriage or the promotion, and then they squander the opportunity. But look at the guy in the house. When that son came back and the father celebrated, he said, Lord, I've been working faithfully so you didn't kill one cow for me. What did the father say? My friend, why you were in my house serving me? Doesn't everything I have belong to you? You are a joint heir. May the Lord give us grace of that. Amen? Quickly, as we round up, how does his intimacy show up? Of course, obviously there's love. But the kind of love is not the Hollywood sentimental love. Total commitment. For God so loved the world. What did he do? What did he give? The critical word in that thing is only. If you remove only, you render that scripture powerless. You are going too far. Don't worry about that. Go back. Elements, examples. We are talking about elements of intimacy now. Thank you. Just stay there. Love is key. The first commandment, you shall love the Lord your God. How? Uh Uh-huh. Now, odd means how many percent? What is the percentage of all? So, if you love God 100%, where is love for your wife? 
Where is love for your job and your career? It's inside the hundred. For many of us, it's outside the hundred. May God teach us what it means to love him with all our heart. I always tell my wife, I don't love her. I tell her, it's God I love. <laughs> I only love you because you are inside God. The day you leave God, forget it. Huh? She doesn't love me. I'm telling you the truth. It's God she loves. <laughs> so most Christians, you are born to love God. Hallelujah. So when you see Christ-likeness in a life, you don't care the tribe, the race, the height. There's a natural closeness. Because all of us, love for God is shared abroad in our heart by who? When the Holy Spirit comes, whose love does he shared in our heart? God's love. And anywhere you see another person who loves God, there's a mutual attraction. So that's why families fall apart not because of the many things we see, but because love for God is falling apart. We're not going to love ourselves and care for ourselves. May God help us to so love him. Another element is desire. We sang the song, Are the deer pants for the water? You can't be intimate without a desire. And be honest with yourself. Do you really desire God? When I came to Lagos, I was amazed that people are so committed to church even where they are not committed to Jesus. They will not miss fellowship, even if they miss quiet time. And I ask myself, why? Because God said the relationship is not personal, it's public. Many can't hear him, so they need a prophet to tell them what God is saying. Many don't know what God wants them to do, so it's what the pastor asks them to do that becomes their preoccupation. May God bring us back to intimacy with him. Not just intimacy with church. When you are intimate with church, you are a churchian. When you are intimate with Christ, you are a Christian. So don't be churchian, be Christians. In Jesus' name. Another element of intimacy is fellowship. Mark 3, 13 to 15. He called the 12 that they might be with him. That's a priority. It's as we are with him that he can use his prerogative to send us to do stuff with him. So, let me close. How do we establish intimacy? I will just use one, two things. One great thing that helps intimacy is encounter. Is what? You can't really be intimate with somebody you have not met. That's why I'm suspicious of online dating, online marriages, and even online worship. <laughs> A brother said, I don't go to church again. I worship online. Then he had a problem and run to one pastor. Say, go online and find help. <sighs> I'm not saying it's not possible. But intimacy, necessity, inquire fellowship. What is fellowship? Two fellows in the same ship. That's my simple definition of fellowship. It's like marriage. You see, marriage is the closest example or laboratory of intimacy. I think when God wanted to teach us intimacy, he instituted marriage. Before you marry, they say meeting a girl. They say desiring. They say proposal. They say an acceptance. And then they say marriage. Intimacy before marriage is sin, isn't it? The same thing with God. So, you encounter God, God encounters you. You begin to desire him, even when you don't understand him. Then you surrender to his offer of love. And then they say, married, you are born again. You can say on so 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 date, I responded to God's professor, and he married me, I became his child. That's the beginning. Without being born again, a definite encounter. Intimacy is fantastic. And may your intimacy not be a fantasy in Jesus' name. You know, fantasy is sin. That's why masturbation and all those things, or sex toys, are not God's idea of intimacy. <laughs> there is the encounter. And there is the need for quietness. Hallelujah. Quietness. Somebody said, Noise, busyness, 
are not just elements of the devil. They are the devil himself. In our generation, there's too much noise. The church is noisy. Worship, noisy. Prayer, noisy. Preaching, noisy. So when do you have the quietness to think? That's why someone said, the difference between Muslims and Christians is that when Muslims go to a mosque, they put their shoes outside. When Christians go to church, they put their brains outside. So just, Amen! Hallelujah! To what? You are just like, it is written. It is written. What is written? You don't know. What are you saying amen to? May the Lord return us to a place of stillness. A place of meditation. So after church, you go home, you meditate. Hallelujah. What did I learn? And when we're young in Christ, the ACU gave us a very simple way to meditate. This scripture you are reading, or this sermon I'm preaching, what does it say about God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? You note. What does it say about man? You note. Is there an example to follow? A promise to claim? A sin to confess? Or oh, how do I not live this week in the light of what I'm hearing? That's application now. And with that simple outline, you are able to come to practical living and not just theoretical Christianity in Jesus' name. The most important thing in establishing intimacy with God is the Holy Spirit. And I want to say, even as the Bible says, in 1 Corinthians 2, if you read verse 10 to 16, who knows the mind of a person except the spirit of that person? And who knows the mind of God except who? So, the Holy Spirit is God's greatest gift to enhance intimacy. You want to know what God wants, ask the Spirit. You want to know how he wants you to do it, ask the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a denomination, he is God. The God we serve manifests himself in Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen? At creation, the Father was in charge. At redemption, the Son was in charge. In this church age, the Holy Spirit is in charge. If you don't know the Holy Spirit, you can't walk with God. I'm not talking about the exhibition of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Whether it's your business, your home, your children, whatever you want to do, ask the Holy Spirit. He knows the mind of God. That's why the Bible says we do not know how to pray as we ought to. But the Holy Spirit does what? Help us. Because the critical thing about prayer is not the style, it's not the length, it's not the loudness. If we ask anything in accordance with God's will, he hears. How do I know God's will? The Holy Spirit. May the Lord grant us a close walk with the Holy Spirit. So if you want me to summarize this morning, you want to be intimate with God, be intimate with the Holy Spirit. In closing, we can also extinguish intimacy. Sin is one big thing. First John chapter 1, verse 5 to 7 says, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If you claim to be walking with God and you are in darkness, you are deceiving yourself. But that's just a part. The B part is he who hates his brother is in darkness. So, two things, obedience to God and love for the brethren enhances intimacy. You can't say you are so close to God and you are far away from me who is God's child. You are lying. How do I measure how close I'm getting to God? How close I'm getting to difficult people around me? Is the measure of my breakthrough with God. When I have a breakthrough with heaven, I will have a breakthrough with man. In fact, when your ways pleases God, even your enemies will be at peace with you. So the best way to deal with enemies is not to call Holy Ghost fire. No, Holy Ghost fire doesn't burn enemy, it burns your heart. The best way to deal with the enemy is to make sure on that matter you please God. Not like that child was saying, how do you deal with forgiveness? Just walk away. What did he say? I was listening. <laughs> he said something. Or like um, 
Mona will say, forgive her and forget about her. No. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Brethren, the most important knowledge is the knowledge of God. And the most important relationship is friendship with God. The most important life pursuit is seeking after God. And the most important exercise is walking with God. Shall we pray? Let's rise up. Let's rise up. Two prayer points as I, I know my time is up. Two prayer points. One is, you can't grow in intimacy with God without a definite encounter. So you are here this morning. You are not sure if you truly have that encounter. The way to know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things pass away. There's a transformation. Your motives are transformed. Your ambitions are transformed. Your character is transformed. Your preoccupation is transformed. And if you are not sure you've had that encounter, not sure you're not born again, this is one opportunity to say, Lord, encounter me this morning. I want to walk with you. Your hands are not short to save. Your ears are not deaf to hear. My sin has separated me. But Jesus, you died on the cross. You shed your blood. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Come into my heart. Be my peace. Break down every wall. Justify me by faith that I may have peace with God. Not only that, I will have access to God and grace to stand and rejoice in hope. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Just say that prayer quietly. And after church, wait behind to talk to someone that I prayed that prayer. Oh, you prayed that prayer years ago, but you backslidden. You know that you and God, you become distant. My sheep hear my voice and follow me. And I give them life. You no longer hear his voice. His voice is faint. So you've lost life. Life comes from following. You only follow as you hear. That has been blocked. One of the things that extinguishes intimacy is worldliness. Distraction of technology. Facebook, WhatsApp, phone. The idols that used to be in shrines have now become products in our hands. And sometimes before you open your Bible in the morning, you read your WhatsApp. Before you pray and talk to God, you are finished talking to friends on Facebook. Instead of facing the real book, you are facing the fake book. The real book is the Bible. Distractions. If you love the world, love for God cannot be. You can't be intimate with the world and be intimate with God. No way. God, deliver me from the love of this world. Deliver me from the love of money, the pride of riches, the pride of wealth, the pride of knowledge. Let me boast in this that I understand and know you. Deliver me from every other boast. I went to Harvard, great, but the spirit doesn't go to university, only the mind. Psalm 16, 11, he has shown us the path of life. It is in his presence. That's where life is. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures. Lord, lead me to your presence where there's life and pleasure. One fallout of urbanization is loneliness and depression. But God has a place for you in his presence. I will see a place at your altar humbly draw near to you I will hide myself in your shadow and worship in spirit and truth I will seek a place at your altar Humbly draw near to you. I will hide my serving your shadows. Worship in spirit and truth.
Even the sparrow has found a nest, a place to lay a young. So we are longing to find a place. So into your courts we come. Into your courts we come. I we see. A place at your altar, humbly draw near to you. I will hide my serving your shadow, worship in spirit and truth. Father, may your spirit envelop us. May your spirit again shed abroad in our hearts love for you, that our hearts will continually cry, Abba, Father. Deliver us from the distractions of time and season. Bring us into the place of quietness. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you.